Hi everyone, so this is the Chapter 7 uh, mapping lecture for our admin book, uh, which covers Chapter 7, uh, Office Safety and the Patient Reception Area of a Medical Office. So this is our first lecture for this course, this Medic 225 course, and you will have found, hopefully by now, if you've worked through the uh, module in Canvas, that you have available to you the PowerPoint slides, and then also that you have been directed to read the chapter in the book. And so what these maps are in the video lectures are basically just an overview of all of the more important points of the lecture um, and it's just kind of a guideline for you to follow along. So a couple of things about the maps. One, it is not meant to be a comprehensive uh, lecture. You can get that from reading the chapter uh, you can get more comprehensive explanations of material from reading the chapter, and also you can get more uh, comprehensive material from the uh, PowerPoint slides that are available to you for download. So also the other thing to remember when you're doing the map is this is meant for you to just kind of physically write out notes and use them to study, so there's really no right or wrong way to make a map. Now, I like to use OneNote, and that's what this is, um, when I'm doing the maps online for my distance ed courses, you can map out uh, however y you would like. You can use paper and pen markers, you can use um, OneNote yourself if you would like, you can use any other note-taking software you have available to you um, on your computer. I like OneNote because I can type and uh, hand draw things in there, so uh, like I said, you there is no right or wrong way to map. The point is to lay out your concept map or your lecture note mind map in a way that it will make sense to you and help you to remember the information. All right, so let's get started. All right, so chapter seven is laid out uh, essentially into two components. The first component covers the office uh, safety plan, and then the second component covers the patient reception area. So we're gonna discuss the office safety plan first, and we begin that with a discussion over the OSHA hazard communication standard. So there's some things that I would like for you to know about that communication standard. And basically what that communication standard says is that workers have the right to know about any chemical that they could be exposed to while they are using it in the workplace. Um, and they are able to find the information about that chemical and by looking at and reading what we call an SDS sheet. Sometimes they're also called MSDS sheets, and that either stands for material safety data sheet or just safety data sheet. So on those safety data sheets, the first eight sections are mandatory by law. There has to be, that information has to be there. And the second eight sections are other um, more technical information. So I'm going to show you what an SDS sheet looks like for something that is commonly found in uh, the medical office. So hang on just a second while I pull that up. So this is the safety data sheet for uh, the Super Sani Cloth germicidal wipes. We use these in every medical office I've ever worked at. We use them at the hospital. I use them in the clinic on campus um, during our injections and venipuncture procedures. Um, so these Super Sani wipes are um, used frequently for germicidal prevention. And so that's what they, it tells you. Uh, the first section of the safety data sheet shows you that the product name is a Super Sani Cloth Germicidal Wipe. Uh, the date for this particular bottle or cylinder of Sani Wipes was October 27th, 2015. And it tells you what the recommended use of the chemical and the restrictions for use are. So it's recommended to be used as a disinfectant on hard non-porous surfaces and so on and so forth. Um, it tells you that it's a violation of federal law to use the product in a manner that's inconsistent with the label directions. Uh, it is for professional and hospital use. So you can't really buy these to use at your house. You can't just pick these sandy wipes up at your local Walmart. You have to um, purchase them from a medical specialty place or a medical supply store. 
um, or manufacturer or supplier, medical supply supplier, um, a medical supplier, I guess it would be, excuse me for all of that jumble there, uh, it tells you the manufacturer's information, their phone number, emergency contact phone numbers. Um, the second section of the SDS sheet is the hazard identification. It shows you that the product is colorless, so it's clear to slightly yellow liquid with alcohol odor impregnated on a wipe. So these wipes look very much like Clorox wipes, if you've seen those. Um, and then they are saturated with this chemical that is uh, impregnated with all of these germicidal properties. Uh, this is one of the requirements that has to be there. There are these pictograms here, and the pictograms show you that this is fire danger and that it is poison. So there are, um, or has eye irritation, sorry. So that's flammable and it can cause eye irritation if there's contact with the eye. So important to note there. And then scrolling down the third section, oops, sorry, back up to the second section, just want to um, point out here also are the precautionary statements, keep away from heat, sparks, open flames, hot surfaces, don't smoke around them while you're using them, you shouldn't be smoking in any place where you would be using them anyway, but just in case, um, and that is because they are uh, flammable. You want to wash your hands thoroughly after handling them. I do not allow students to handle these gloves or these sandy wipes without gloves on anyway, um, just because, you know, you're in contact with chemicals. So you should probably always wear gloves and then wash hands after you have removed your gloves from handling them. So uh, the third section, composition, information on ingredients. The fourth section, first aid measures. Uh, how to handle contact exposure. So if it's come in contact with the eye, with the skin, if you've inhaled it, it tells you here that inhalation is not a normal route of exposure. That's because people don't normally go around huffing these sandy wipes, but in today's society, you never really know. Same thing with ingestion. People don't typically go around eating the sandy wipes, but again, you don't really know. Um, if you have normal small amounts um, transferred from hands to mouth, it's not really a big deal. Um, but so there's not really a whole lot of first aid offered there. Uh, the it tells you the most important symptoms, effects, and acu of acute and delayed symptoms and effects. Uh, direct contact may cause eye irritation, and then indication of immediate medical attention. You shouldn't have to be, no immediate medical attention should be required if you have normal conditions of use. So if you're using these as you should use them, then you shouldn't really need any like emergent medical care. Uh, firefighting measures are listed for section five. Section six lists the accidental release measures. So there's all of the information there. Section seven is another required section and that is handling and storage. Tells you um, how to properly handle this product, this chemical, and also how to properly store it. And then section eight is the exposure control and personal protection. So uh, it tells you all of the information you need to know there about what to do um, to keep yourself protected if you are exposed. Um, and then the next eight sections, numbers 9 through 16, are all of the more technical information. So it's the physical and chemical properties, and then the stability and reactivity, toxicological information, sorry my email keeps popping up, and well, uh, ecological information, disposal considerations, all of those things are just as important, um, but for a typical um, employee who's just using these wipes to sanitize their work areas, maybe not quite as important as the exposure information or protective information, cautionary information is going to be in the first eight sections. So that's a standard uh, SDS sheet, 
and we have these for everything. I mean, you have SDS sheets for window cleaner, Windex, and regular Lysol wipes. Even dry erase markers have SDS sheets. So there are SDS sheets for literally anything that has a chemical that you could be exposed to in your workplace. All right, I'm gonna switch back over to the lecture and we'll talk about the labels. So according to the OSHA hazard communication standard, as of June 1st, 2015, all the labels are going to be required to have pictograms, a signal word, hazard and precautionary statements, a product identifier, and a supplier identification. So then there can also be some supplemental information that can be provided on the label as well. So I wanted to show you what the label looks like for that uh, SDS sheet that we just covered. So this is the Super Sandy Cloth Germicidal Disposable Wipe. And you can see that we have, um, let me get my pen out here. We have uh, pictograms, not skin or baby wipe. We have things not to flush. Um, we have simple graphics here. It's pretty basic. It just says super sandy cloth, uh, extra large wipe. Tells you what the active ingredients are here. You have the manufacturer's information. Um, basic information back here on the back side of the label. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward label, and that is what we're looking for. That meets all of the requirements uh, for the OSHA regulations. All right, so moving on to electrical safety, which is the next section. Electrical safety. isn't really one that maybe um, people think about all that often when you're going to work. I mean, I know that when I walk onto campus, the first thing that crosses my mind is not how safe the uh, electrical appliances in my office are or in my classroom are, but it is something that we should try to be mindful of and take precautions for. So a couple of things that I would just like for you to be mindful of. First of all, uh, extension cords, when they're overloaded, can become an electrical safety issue. They're a fire hazard. Um, so we want to only use extension cords on a temporary basis and to try not to overload them. You want to obviously repair equipment with damaged cords. If you are a fan of This Is Us, and you have seen the Jack Pearson episode with the crock pot, you know exactly why we need to make sure that we are repairing equipment with damaged cords. If you're a fan of This Is Us and I just spoiled Jack Pearson's death episode for you, I apologize from the bottom of my heart, but you will cry. It's terrible. Um, and if you, um, if you uh, have faulty cords in those um, appliances, then they should they need to be unplugged and just thrown away and replaced as appliances do. Also, to keep electrical appliances away from water and don't touch them with damp hands. You would think that that would be common sense, right? Because we're taught from the time that we're kids to not uh, mix water and electricity. You don't use your hair dryer when you're in the bathtub and so on and so forth. But the thing is, people very often forget that our cell phones are electrical appliances and we have our phones with us all of the time often near water while we're washing our hands. Um, we'll have phone, phones charging near sinks. And so we need to be very careful, um, especially with our cell phones these days, and make sure that we are keeping water away from all of our electrical appliances. Fire safety is the next section. And I drew my little flames over here. You like that? This little guy over here. Uh, fire safety is um, always important. Fires are terrifying and we want to make sure that we are always uh, aware of potential high voltage medical equipment that is in the office, that is in use in the office. So any uh, machines, ultrasound machines, EKG machines, uh, anything like that, um, because those can arc 
and those obviously would be uh, a, a safety issue uh, for potential fire. Any extremely flammable materials are noted and have to be stored properly, so oxygen tanks, like in that, that is noted actually right down here. Uh, oxygen is stored properly and not in use uh, where smoking could occur. Smoking is generally banned from within, you know, 20 to 35 feet of a, the entrance of a medical facility anyhow, but sometimes, you know, things happen. So we want to make sure that it is uh, always properly stored and not in use anywhere where smoking could happen. We want to make sure that all of the smoke detectors are functioning properly. Most medical facilities will have um, the fire marshal come in and do um, inspections and those have to happen um, annually. And so um, we want to make sure that those annual inspections are happening frequently so that we know that the sprinkler system and the smoke detectors are all working. We want to make sure that all of the equipment, the kitchen equipment is functioning properly. We want to make sure that uh, if you have to put out a fire, we are using the PASS method with a fire extinguisher, and that stands for pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. We want to make sure that if we have to evacuate the building, we are using the race, rescue, activate, alarm, confine, the fire, and then extinguish. So we want to get everybody out first, activate the alarm, uh, confine the fire, oops, sorry about that, and then extinguish it. In order to get everybody out, you have to know the evacuation route, and then in order to, part of activating the alarm is not just pulling the fire alarm, but it's also remembering to call 911. So definitely make sure we remember how to do that. The third section of, uh, nope, I'm sorry, fourth section of our medical office safety plan is chemical safety. So chemical safety uh, involves how we store and handle all of the chemicals that we can use. So we talked about those MSDS sheets over there in the OSHA uh, hazard communication plan, but how we store them and label them is a big deal too. So even though we have to do that in compliance with OSHA, sometimes people get kind of lax and it's important to remember not to do that. We want to make sure that we are storing hazardous materials below eye level, and that is so we're not reaching up onto a shelf and then accidentally spilling a gallon of bleach into our eyes. Um, we want to make sure that we're wearing protective gear and carrying chemicals with both hands so that we don't accidentally have spills. We want to make sure that we do not inhale the chemicals directly. And we do that uh, hopefully by working in a well-ventilated area so that we do not become uh, overwhelmed by fumes from the chemicals. You want to make sure you do not mix random chemicals. They are chemicals. They have chemical reactions when they are mixed with other chemicals, and that can uh, cause some pretty serious um, fumes to happen. You want to never clean up chemicals with your bare hands that can eat your, some of those chemicals are very caustic and acidic and they can eat your skin, literally eat your skin. Um, and you always want to know where the eye wash station is in your place of employment so that if chemicals splash in your eyes, you can go and wash the chemicals out immediately. So the next section is ergonomic and physical safety while at work. Ergonomics are the way that we move our body to help fight fatigue. So good body mechanics can reduce workplace injuries, and basically all you need to do is use common sense. Um, you want to make sure that you have good posture, and then don't do things like standing on chairs to reach for things. So you want to try to lift with your legs instead of with your back. Um, also, as far as physical safety goes, you want to be mindful of what you're doing and where you're doing it. You don't want to eat or drink or apply lipstick in a lab area where there are bacterial uh, uh, culture samples growing or viral culture samples growing. You don't want to put your lunch in the same fridge with a histology specimen or you know where there's an extra tissue sample being stored. So you want to be mindful of those things. I mean, besides that, that's kind of gross. Um, you want to know where the first aid kit is, where the shower station is, and where the eye wash is so that you can keep yourself um, prepared in case of exposure to anything. 
Uh, the second section, or the part two of our, sorry, I slid you down and I meant to go over. Part two of our lecture involves the design of the reception area. So the reception area is where we greet patients and we want to try to avoid calling it a waiting room because waiting implies that, you know, we're it's an inconvenience to them, and it is, that's a fact, um, but we want to make it more of a welcoming area rather than an inconvenient area for the patients. So how the reception area is decorated is going to depend on the type of practice, and we're going to talk about those things down below in just a moment. But at any rate, no matter which type of practice it is, the MA should make the area safe and welcoming and efficient. The reception area is the patient's first point of contact in the office. So that is the first impression. And the front office MA is going to be the one typically giving the office's first impression to a patient. When designing the office reception area, we want to think about space. And the size of the space is going to be determined by the amount of patients that are seen in the office every day. So the daily patient flow. And how the space is used is going to depend on the type of practice. So for example, an orthopedic office may need wheelchair space. Uh, and a pediatric office may need to have a space with separate areas for sick kids versus healthy kids. We also want to be mindful to have enough space that we are um, aware of privacy issues and protective of patients uh, protected health information and then also germs we don't want to be, have people crammed in there like sardines so that coughing patients can just spread germs all over the place When we're looking at decor options, we want to make sure that we are sticking with like one color family for all the colors and fabrics. So varying shades of a color family tend to work better so that we create a unified and um, continuous color palette throughout the office. We want to think about the way that we want the office to feel for the patient. So red, uh, the color red uses is used to elevate heart rate and blood pressure. Blue is a calming color. Green is a color that's neutral and easy on the eyes. And then white is often used um, in hospital rooms like emergency rooms uh, and like trauma to imply clean clinical areas or purity. Sometimes you will see, if you next time you walk through a hospital or a doctor's office, Pay attention to the colors that are located in different areas. Um, sometimes the waiting rooms will be blue or be green um, to be more calming. Sometimes the exam areas will be white to imply uh, a, a sterile area. So just kind of pay attention and see if you can notice a pattern in the colors that are used in the various areas and see if you can pick up the vibe that they're trying to um, put out there with the way that the decor is arranged. Furniture um, should have no sharp edges. That's pretty obvious. We don't want little kids or elderly people or anybody really falling into anything with sharp edges. Should have comfy sitting furniture. Nothing is more of a bummer than when you're stuck in a waiting room um, for a long time, especially uh, in a reception area of a doctor's office while you're waiting for a family member to come out or if you as a patient are in pain um, and you are in an uncomfortable chair that's kind of a bummer so you want to have comfy sitting furniture you want to make sure that there is good spacing between the chairs or the seating arrangements and then any enhancements um, decorations can be included out there too as long as they aren't detracting so you don't want to put like a fish tank out there with and then have um, it become a detractor if there's dead fish floating in it or you don't want to put uh, flowers out there and then them become live flowers and then them become a detractor because they've wilted and died so you just want to be mindful of the enhancement decorations that you're putting out into the patient reception area as well all right, so everything else that you should kind of consider while you're arranging or designing the patient reception area. The lights should never be too bright or too dim. 
Uh, the room temperature should be comfortable, and it needs you when you're considering room temperature, it should be comfortable for both elderly populations um, who are often cold, and for uh, average populations. And uh, if you're playing music, you should play some type of soothing music that's usually best. Education materials need to be displayed nicely. And one note over here about uh, displaying educational materials is that they can be messy sometimes. And so you might want to put them on the wall or someplace where they aren't kind of scattered all over the place. That's kind of a devil's advocate thing with the educational materials is when you leave them laying out is that sometimes they are shredded or they become more of a eyesore than anything. So those wall racks um, typically are better to display educational pamphlets. So um, if you are designing, uh, I would suggest maybe a wall mounted rack to display that educational material in. Okay, so for television, you want to be careful when you're selecting what to play on a television. Now, many offices and waiting areas or reception areas have uh, televisions available to for viewing uh, for the patients or for those who are waiting in the reception area. And the television should be tuned to something that's benign or something that's relatively uh, unoffensive to the majority of people. Um, tip, so sometimes uh, offices will put health educational materials <clears throat> on those uh, TV stations. Uh, it's also helpful sometimes to have captions in Spanish for our non-English speaking um, populations. You have to be careful when you're deciding what to play on TV because there's so much controversy these days that about almost anything you put on the TV outside of health education and even some health education programs is going to offend about 50% of the population. So you want to stay clear of um, no politics and even news is questionable these days. Um, so if it's a pediatric office, you're in the clear because you can basically put Disney on and call it a day. But if it's not a pediatric office, you just, you know, you have to be very mindful of what it is that you're playing on the TV. You want to design the reception area for the patient population, and we spoke about that a little bit up here, um, but we uh, talk about it a little bit more here. If you're designing a pediatric area, you want to use things like small furniture for kids that's easier to get in and out of for kids uh, in one section of the reception room. So obviously you're not going to design the whole entire reception room with all tiny furniture because it's going to be really hard for the moms and dads to get down in that tiny furniture. But you will design one area of the reception room with all small furniture for the children to utilize. You want to design uh, an area uh, for sick kids and for better kids and then you want to um, stock toys, games, all of those things, and they should all be easily disinfected and sanitized because you're going to want to sanitize them on a daily basis. Sick kids spread germs. It's just a fact of life. And so we don't want a kid uh, coughing and, you know, handling a toy and then another kid coming in the next morning and picking up that toy and, you know, picking up whatever the kid was uh, suffering from. So we have to sanitize those toys every day. Also, when you're thinking about pediatrics, you want to have no small pieces that can be swallowed or shoved into an orifice. So no beads or any tiny moving parts that can be shoved into a nose hole or an ear hole or swallowed. Housekeeping uh, with the reception area is usually the duty of a medical assistant and the daily cleaning needs to be done. Sometimes it's hired out, sometimes there's a cleaning service that comes and does it. But usually like the cleaning, uh, the light cleaning of the reception area is the responsibility of the medical, for the front office medical assistant. Uh, we want to make sure that we are trying to keep offending odors at bay as much as possible, but sometimes patient body odors contribute to that. So for example, if there's a patient who is a heavy smoker and they come into the uh, office and they are seated into, into the reception area, the smoke that is clinging to their clothes um, and to their hair and to their skin oftentimes permeates through the air in the waiting area. Uh, and so you have um, 
to contend with that. And if it's super offensive, it may be best to try to get that patient back out of the reception area um, sooner rather than later so that they do not uh, offend, that odor doesn't offend, um, you know, all of the others that are sitting in the reception area. Biohazard waste uh, is not common in the reception area, but it could happen if a patient vomits or has a nosebleed. It is considered infectious waste and a danger to others, and you just want to make sure you're following the OSHA guidelines to clean up any biohazardous waste. So the next section, whoops, I meant to scroll over. The next section is uh, ADA compliance. So ADA stands for Americans with Disability Act and then we also have separately but equally as important the Older Americans Act. Both of those acts together have made physical access to medical offices easier for all patients not just elderly or disabled patients. So some things that we need to be mindful of to be in compliance with ADA and the OAA is on-street parking uh, or a parking lot with handicapped spaces, ramps, etc. Um, so that the building is accessible for those who are handicapped or elderly. If the building is attached to a parking garage, then we need to have a parking garage with the same type of accessibility. Uh, a parking garage with handicapped spaces and if it's a multi-floor parking garage, then one with elevators. The entrances should be clearly marked the name of the practice or the physician on the door so that it's easily identifiable to those that are coming into the building. Uh, wide enough hallways to accommodate wheelchairs and walkers and other assistive devices. Well lit areas without obstructions. Secure buildings, um, which means that it's safe for our patients to go to and from the building at any time of day. So that could include things such as security systems, cameras, electronic keypads, uh, and so on. And then the uh, allowance of service animals. Now this may not necessarily be emotional support animals, but full on uh, certified service animals like seeing eye dogs, uh, hearing dogs, those types of things. The last section that we have, I'm going to slide over here, right on over here, over here, over here, uh, are the functions of the reception staff. So the reception staff functions to help patients sign in and register. They scan the insurance card and obtain all the signatures on the necessary insurance forms so that we can be reimbursed. The uh, reception staff or the front office MAs observe patients. One thing uh, we want to make sure we are doing as front office MAs is to not make them wait if they are bleeding, fainting, vomiting, or short of breath. Those are all pretty obvious, but felt like it was important enough to put in here. Uh, and then there are a couple of opening and closing the office uh, tasks that we need to be aware of. So upon opening the office, you want to arrive 30 minutes before the first patient, deactivate the security alarms, check the phone for messages, uh, boot up any computers or printers or any other electronics, and then, uh, you know, coffee. Coffee is always good first thing in the morning if that's your thing. You can sometimes put coffee on. Sometimes that's an actual part of the morning routine is turning on the coffee pot. To close the office down in the afternoon, you want to prep essential staff for the next day, turn off the equipment according to the office policy, store any confidential information, and then turn on the answering service and set the security before you leave for the night. So that's pretty much the overview for Chapter 7. One thing I did want to show you is that uh, there's a list of questions over here on the side that I forgot to mention when we started the lecture. And so these guys over here are all um, the questions that I 
want to have answered at the end of the map. So what I do at the beginning of every map, I start all of the maps with a list of the questions that, like I said, I want to have answered by the time I'm done with it. And if these questions look familiar to you, they should, because these are all of the uh, learning outcomes for you that are listed at the beginning of chapter seven. And so what I do is I just kind of reword them a little bit, turn them into questions so I remember to answer them, and then make sure I hit all of those as I go through the concept map. So if we're looking at number one here, what are the components of an office safety plan? We now know that the office safety plan includes everything from the uh, OSHA hazard communication standard and, and electrical safety, fire safety, ergonomic and physical safety, chemical safety, um, and uh, all of these different components that we talked about. If we want to look at what does the OSHA hazard communication do, we talked about the SDS sheets, we went through that one for the sandy cloth, the labels, and then so on and so forth. So what are ergonomics? How do I keep the reception area clean? How does ADA affect the office? So basically, it's just a list of questions that I want to make sure I know the answers to uh, by the end of the map. And so when we are all done, whew, let me get rid of that. Once we are all done, um, we should have a better um, understanding of what the map looks like. Let me make it all one here for you. And then you can kind of see the whole thing in its entirety. So all of the questions over here have been answered and they have been answered by our whole map. So that's it. That's This is pretty much how the video lectures will go for all of the chapters. Uh, hopefully mapping is beneficial to you. It helps me. I'm a very uh, creative person in general and then I also like to, I have to do things. I'm a manual learner um, and so I need to write things down to remember them and uh, I'm a visual learner so I have to see things to remember them and so hopefully uh, mapping will help you if you are the same type of learner by listening to me and then mapping them out on your own it will help you retain the information also. If you guys have any questions, you are welcome to email me or message me through Canvas and uh, also check out the chat button over in the navigation panel on Canvas to see if I'm online and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks guys.